Consider the following five points. These points uh, demonstrate that there is at least a biblical basis for holding to the Unitarian position and that the Unitarian position makes the most biblical sense. Number one, God is always presented as a singular person. God gave us the scriptures in normal human language and the singular personal pronouns of I, me, he, and him refer to one person. Therefore, when the Bible uses these words to refer to God, it's teaching us that God is one person. The handful of times that the Bible uses a plural pronoun to refer to God must be weighed against the thousands of times that the singular personal pronoun and verb are used for God. Consider the following passages. Firstly, Deuteronomy 4.39. It says, Know therefore today, and take it to your heart, that the Lord, He is God in heaven above, and on the earth below, and there is no other. Or what about Deuteronomy 32, 39? It says, See now that I, I am He, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. These passages tell us that God is one person by the continued use of I and me. Again, the continued usage of singular personal pronouns must teach us that God is one person, not three persons. The second point we can make is that Jesus is always presented in the Bible as a distinct person from the one God. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is some agreement with Trinitarianism here in the fact that Jesus is a distinct person from the Father. But what I can show you is that in the Bible, Jesus is not only distinct from the Father, but just the one God. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says that there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Messiah, Jesus. Here, Paul obviously contrasts the man, Messiah, Jesus with the one God. Trinitarians would have to say, well, okay, uh, Jesus is the second person of that one God. But that seems a little odd that Jesus would be the mediator between two of the persons of the Godhead, the Father and the Spirit and men, but not himself. That doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. So I think that the Unitarian position, as I was saying earlier, makes the most biblical sense. And in fact, in John chapter 17, verse, verse 3, Jesus calls the Father the only true God. He's in prayer to the Father and he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus the Messiah whom you have sent. So here Jesus in prayer is declaring the way to eternal life, and that is to know the Father, the person he is speaking to, and he calls the Father the only true God. And for eternal life, we also have to go through Jesus the Messiah, as he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Again, note that Jesus calls his, the Father the only true God. In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, Paul says, For us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus the Messiah, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So here in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that there is one God, and that's the Father, similar to what Jesus said, that he, Jesus called the Father the one only true God, and there is one Lord, and he is Jesus the Messiah, the one through which we have access to the Father. So, here in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, where Jesus is called the one Lord, uh, that is clarified if you turn over to Psalm 110, verse 1. It says, the Lord, referring to God, because it is the Tetragrammaton, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is a Psalm of David in which David is looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, and it's David speaking, and he says that God, the Lord, said to my Lord, that is David's Lord, and who can be David's Lord? Well, his exalted son, the Messiah, the son of David. So, the Lord said to David's Lord, that is the Messiah, that 
he should sit at God's right hand until God makes an enemy, all of, all of, all of his enemies, a footstool for his feet. And this is similar to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses uh, 27 and 28. It says, For he has put things in subjection under his feet. He has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says, all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. What is Paul saying here? Paul's saying here that, that God put all things under the Messiah's feet, but obviously not God himself. So he clarifies, he says, verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. So Paul is clearly making a distinction between God, the one who exalted, exalted Jesus at his right hand and put all of it, his enemies under a footstool, but also recognizes that Jesus is in a highly exalted position. And we know this from elsewhere from Paul's writings in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. It says... That for this reason, Jesus' obedience to, the, to God, it says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus the Messiah is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So, who is the one that exalted him? God. It says, God highly exalted him. And who is identified as God? In the, in the last part of verse 11, the Father. It's pretty consistent that Jesus is not God. He is the Son of God, the highly exalted human Lord that we all should pledge allegiance to. But he is not God. God is his Father. third point we can make is that texts that strongly appear to equate Jesus with God uh, actually usually have a literary parallel that shows you that it's not to be taken literally, but more so poetically. And we see this, of course, most famously in John chapter 1, the prologue of, of the, the Gospel of John. It says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, Christians usually equate this with the person of Jesus in some pre-existent form. But I think it makes more sense to understand this as poetic language, that John here is personifying the Word of God, and then later in verse 14, equating him with Jesus. Because it says in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, yes, Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. But that's to be taken in more of a metaphorical sense in the fact that Jesus, as a sinless human being, perfectly per represents God. And therefore, you can say that Jesus embodies the Word of God or the wisdom of God. Now, back in Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, we see in chapter 3, verse 19, that it says, The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Now, uh, Jewish writers of the day, and then obviously contemporary with the apostles, uh, understood that wisdom was there in the beginning with God. They, they actually personified wisdom. So in Proverbs 8, verse 27, it says, when, and this is wisdom speaking, so to speak, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. And it goes on, and, but it's, it's wisdom, who is actually uh, a female, speaking and saying that she was there from the beginning. Uh, and she was there when God created the earth, and that that, the create, that by wisdom, God created the universe. Um, is that to be taken literally? Was there a fourth person of the Godhead there, and her name was Wisdom? No, I think that what we need to do is understand that some of these texts in the Bible uh, use poetic language to, to, to specifically, in reference to Jesus, being the embodiment. As a human being, he, as a sinless human being, he is the embodiment of God himself. Uh, it says in John 1.14, as I said, that the Word became flesh. And then Jesus himself said in John 14, verse 9, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And unless you take that in a modalistic sort of way, that Jesus literally is the Father, what that has to mean is that when you see the man Jesus, you are seeing what God is like as a human being. But it, he's still a man, and he's still a distinct person from the one God.
The scripture never requires us to believe that Jesus is God. Rather, we are to confess that Jesus is our Lord, he is our Savior, he's our Rabbi, our Teacher, he is the King of Israel, and obviously, he is Mashiach, he is the Messiah, he is the Christ. He is the one that is to come and, he, and rule over Israel and the nations. For example, Matthew 16:16, 16, 16, Peter correctly confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. And in John chapter 20, verse 31, John says, These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So neither Peter nor John say that Jesus is God, but rather that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And uh, in a popular, familiar passage in Romans chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 9, Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Paul doesn't say that you have to confess that Jesus is God, but rather that Jesus is Lord. Lord like in Psalm 110.1, where it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make it your enemies a footstool for your feet. Or as Paul himself said, that God had highly exalted Jesus and gave him the name which is above all names, that the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven on earth and under the earth, will confess that Jesus is the Lord to God's own glory. So, yes, Jesus is the highest exalted being in the universe, but he's still under God. Jesus is the exalted, sinless, human Son of God. The fifth point we can make is that God possesses certain attributes that are simply incompatible with being human. Uh, among those, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, Paul, making a blessing to God, says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And then later in the epistle, in just a couple chapters later, in chapter 6, verse 16, Paul says, again referring to, in verse 15, he says, to the He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And in verse 16 he says, Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So, we learn from in these two verses from Paul that the only God is immortal and invisible. And from verse 16 here in chapter 6, it says, Who alone possesses immortality. So immediately you can say, well, wait a second, Jesus is immortal. Yes, but that immortality was given to him. So this must be a reference to the fact that God inherently possesses immortality. That is, that is he can never die in any sense, however you define death. God can never die. And he says that, Paul says that God dwells in unapproachable light, and God, no man has seen God or can see God. And John chapter 1 verse 18 says that no one has seen God. So, was Jesus seen? And was Jesus mortal? Yes, Jesus was seen, he was visible, and he obviously died, since that is the whole basis of our faith, that Jesus the Messiah died for our sins. So, God whom Paul calls the only God in chapter 1, verse 17, is immortal and invisible. But Jesus was mortal and invisible. I think we've reached another point where Unitarianism makes more biblical sense that the Father is the one who is who, whom Paul and the other writers of Scripture continually call the only God, the one God. And Jesus is the human Son of God, and he's truly human, he's fully human. Uh, it's not, as the Trinitarians would say, that Jesus is fully human, but also fully God, as if that makes any sense. How can you be fully human, being mortal, visible, not knowing everything, being able to be tempted, but also be fully God, which means you're invisible, you're immortal, you're, you, you are not able to be tempted, and you know everything. So, how can those things be true at the same time, which Trinitarians must hold in order for the Incarnation or, or the double nature of the Messiah to actually uh, make sense? It doesn't make sense. That's the, that's the problem. So, again, we conclude to say that Unitarianism makes the most biblical sense, and it is the position that we hold.